During the next half hour, we'll take you to Holy Name Cathedral, where Archbishop Blaise Supich ordained 14 men to the priesthood. We'll hear from the newly ordained themselves, and we'll talk with the Archbishop about the state of vocations in the Archdiocese of Chicago. Also at the cathedral, the Galero of Cardinal Francis George is raised to the ceiling on the one-month anniversary of the Cardinal's death. And protecting our children is the theme of a pinwheel prayer service in the Healing Garden. Welcome to Catholic Chicago. The Archdiocese of Chicago is a vibrant and diverse faith community. We celebrate our faith through worship, evangelization, and reaching out to the needy. Welcome to Catholic Chicago. Hello, I'm Todd Williamson, Director of the Office for Divine Worship for the Archdiocese of Chicago. And joining me here in the studio, as always, is Archbishop Blaise Supich. Archbishop, it's good to see you again. Good to be with you, Todd. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Today in the show, we're talking about vocations, which is rather timely because you're about to ordain 14 men to the priesthood. Yes, and uh, just um, a short time ago, I uh, ordained seven uh, deacons right. uh, at the seminary. So this 14 will be a, a wonderful welcome group for us. And they come from a diverse background uh, that reflects the diversity in archdiocese. Nice. How so? Well, there are uh, people who are uh, who are from a Polish heritage, mm -hmm. Hispanic uh, here, uh, who were born uh, uh, in this country, who are Anglo's, as they say. Uh, uh, so we really do have that diversity. Uh, present in this uh, population of, of new priests. And it's needed, right, in this archdiocese. That very kind of much so, very much so. We really are a diverse archdiocese and one that um, is uh, not a burden but a blessing. Mm -hmm. We find that uh, the faith expressions in those different cultures uh, do enrich us as a church and I'm, uh, uh, I'm really just uh, energized whenever I go to an ethnic parish or a particular area uh, where the Mass is celebrated in, in a little different way with that tradition because it shows us what, what it really means to be mm -hmm. Catholic. Mm -hmm. The rite itself of ordination, I think, is, is, is one of the more profound rites that we have uh, in, our, in our liturgical corpus. What is the most, uh, for you, what is the most moving part of the rite of ordination? Because there's a number of, I think, profound components. There are, and I, I find that uh, People's uh, attention uh, always, they, it always gravitates uh, towards that silent moment of the laying on of hands. In fact, the ritual actually says mm -hmm. it has to be done in silencio. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that means that there can't be any music or any other kind of prayers or words. It's just that simple gesture of the bishop placing hands on the candidate's head, which is a very ancient ritual. Uh, we see it, it's tied to the scriptures uh, right. and it's moments in which uh, the invocation of the Spirit for a particular task uh, was, was, uh, was given. And, uh, and I, I find that that is the moment in which uh, I uh, really feel uh, that my office and what I do as a bishop in providing for the next generation of priests uh, is celebrated with, with, with real great uh, uh, solemnity. As you noted, uh, this is one of the few gestures that we can trace back to apostolic times. The apostles were the ones who laid hands, right? And then uh, following that, all priests concelebrating then Right. will follow you and lay hands as well. I That's agree. It's terribly they do. profound. They do. And, and of course, with our numbers here, um, I always try to counsel mm -hmm. uh, the priests who are imposing hands not to uh, press th so hard that they, uh, they in some way push them into the ground, these poor <laughs> candidates. Uh, as I told one group, I said, besides, we don't want to, to give them a stiff neck because there's nothing worse than a stiff neck cleric. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for our viewers uh, who may have never been to a rite of ordination, all of the candidates are kneeling. Uh, the, uh, the ordinandi are kneeling right. at this point. Right, that's right. Um, and, and just to see that line uh, of, of, of soon-to-be brother priests is, is really very moving. 
Another, I think, moving part of the ordination rite um, is when the candidates lay prostrate, when they, yes. they, they lay face down and the rest of the liturgical assembly sings the Litany of Saints. Right, and we do. Uh, that really, um, in many ways for me, strikes at uh, a central tenet of our beliefs, and that is that uh, we don't worship uh, just within this community here and now yeah. in this place but we do so with a community of saints. Uh, that's why, for instance, in the Sanctus, the Holy, we say heaven and earth uh, joins us, joins our voices as we proclaim holy, holy, holy. Uh, and, and so by calling upon the saints uh, to be with us, it really gives us an understanding of what it means for us to be church. Having been ordained, uh, uh, obviously I haven't, um, what's it like to, if you can recall, to, to lie there and, and to hear the church calling our heroes, right, and heroines, right. all these, these who have gone before us, calling them to stand with us now at this moment? Well, it is. Uh, it's very touching, but also not only just to hear the names of the saints, but hear the voices of people who are with mm -hmm. me. Uh, because that, uh, I think, uh, needs to be taken in consideration too, because those people I will depend on. Uh, uh, that has happened to me now three times, of mm -hmm. course, being mm -hmm. ordained a deacon and then a priest and, um, uh, and as a bishop. And in each one of those ceremonies, there is a litany of the saints and the prostration, as they call it, of the candidate. Yeah, and at that moment, um, I just I can only imagine for those who are who you'll ordain, so much going through their heads. In fact, Archbishop, our office for TV and radio caught up with some of the ordinands to get their reflections on all of this. Let's take a look. Great. As a young child, I certainly felt the call to be a priest. Um, it wasn't necessarily encouraged at that time. Went on to high school, went on to college, fell away from the faith for a while, went into journalism, so I was in the newspaper business. And uh, roughly about 10 years ago, kind of returned to my faith. And then the more I returned to the faith, the more that calling to serve Christ as a priest came back. And I answered that call. I'm 46, but I think that in my case, it works to my advantage because I wouldn't have been as good a priest as maybe I'm going to be now if, when I was 26. I needed to see life, I needed to do experience some things and be humbled. I think I have a compassion now that I wouldn't have had when I was 26. I was uh, involved in youth groups here in Chicago, in the Chicago area, and I felt the call to enter the seminary. At that moment I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a priest, but I felt the call to do something with my life, which I was in church. In church I wasn't sure what it was, but it became clear later on during the uh, process in the seminary. I have done a few baptisms, and that is one of the things that really moves my heart, because uh, you get to bring new Christians into the church every time you do a baptism. Well, I'm from Durango, Mexico, um, which is in the north part of Mexico. I grew up in a really small village, but everybody's Catholic, and well, was Catholic in that village, and it was like, part of my life all the time. Well, I've actually wanted to be a priest ever since I was about five or six years old. I've always said that's what I would do. Uh, when I graduated high school, though, um, I wanted to travel and see the world, so I joined the military. Uh, I did that for about six years, and just towards the end of that time, I just wasn't feeling as uh, fulfilled as I, as I thought I should be, you know, and I started to have that call again towards, um, towards priesthood. And so when I got out of the service, I started pursuing that again, and enter the seminary. My parents will be here, they're um, from Georgia, so they're coming in town for that, and uh, pretty excited to have my mom and dad here for it. So I guess what I'm looking forward to most um, after ordination is uh, celebrating the sacraments, um, mass, reconciliation, baptism. I love doing baptisms. Um, I think those are, those are the things I'm looking forward to the most, just being with the people. We choose these, our brothers, for the order of the priesthood. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Uh, I'm from Kenya and uh, when I was growing up as a kid, I started falling in love with priesthood and I was an altar boy from the age of seven and I've always been there. And for me, a priest was a source of uh, leadership, was a source of purpose in the community. So most kids in my family or in my neighborhood, they only think of two things, a priest and a teacher. So it was something natural from their family. Once I'm ordained, I'm looking forward to working with the Hispanic 
I've done some Spanish, not so good, but I hope it, I'm going to improve with time. Where I come from, the church is so lively, and each, each time I attend an Hispanic uh, mass, it's so lively. I just want to be the moment of life-changing moment, not only for me, but for all of those guys who are here, for my mom who came from Poland, from my other nation, and my friend who is a associate pastor in my home parish in Poland, he came to see me to here. He's a representative of my parish here in Chicago, from Poland, from the priest, priest from Poland, and I just want to be this moment to be for me and for my family as well. Uh, the only thing I need, I'm looking for is just to bring people to God, bring people to heaven, that's our goal, heaven, you know. And that's where we are leaders, we are the shepherds who lead people to, to Jesus, to heaven, you know. Uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, I had a great religion teacher and she introduced me to theology. I fell in love with the discipline and I knew that I discovered my life's work. So, uh, and at the same time, I sort of discovered my vocation. So they kind of came from the same thing. Um, I'm looking forward to the, the, the moment of the ordination ceremony that everybody talks about, which is really the, uh, the prostrations during the Litany of Saints. Uh, it was very powerful for me during the deacon ordination and I'm sure it'll be twice as powerful for the priesthood. Uh, certainly just, you know, to be prostrate on the floor, giving your entire self over to God as you know, the men and women who have come before us in the faith are invoked to come to our assistance and our aid. That's what I'm looking forward to the most. I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to working with young people, uh, with young adults, uh, with, uh, you know, professionals in their 20s and 30s. Uh, people who are at a moment in their life when they really have everything that they might want materially, uh, but could still very much be looking for something more than that. And uh, I hope certainly to be a guide uh, for them and, you know, to show them what may be lacking in some of their lives is God. Um, Archbishop, 14 men. That's pretty healthy. Would you say that the state of the vocations to the, uh, vocations to the priesthood are, are strong here in the Archdiocese of Chicago? Well, they are, uh, but we can always use more. And I'm not saying this to be greedy uh, or to be unthankful for the vocations we have. But I do know that uh, with the aging population we have in our clergy uh, and the needs that are out there, um, uh, we do need more vocations. Uh, it's good to have 14, but that's a record year, mm -hmm. and it's not going to be replicated every year. And we see that uh, as the numbers uh, that are needed uh, are not there right now, uh, it is my hope and prayer that uh, more uh, candidates will step forward. Mm -hmm. Well, 14 for a record year is wonderful for Chicago, Archbishop. Do you have a sense of the state of vocations on a broader perspective, uh, the United States, or even vocations to the priesthood globally? I am hearing this year that there is going to be a slight uptick, oh, nice. which uh, I think is uh, very encouraging to all of us. And worldwide, uh, it's been fairly steady as well. Mm -hmm. My hope would be that because there is an uptick, it will encourage others uh, to consider it. Uh, there's nothing like success to breed more success. Yeah, yeah. And certainly here in Chicago, um, our seminary system is rather extensive and developed. Uh, not a lot of places can say that they have four different seminaries. Right, and we have a lot of personnel and, re and a lot of resources that are dedicated to this important effort. And we all know, of course, that Mundelein Seminary uh, is not only nationally but internationally mm -hmm. known. Uh, it is one of the largest in the world and it's a seminary that has a wonderful record uh, of uh, educating priests, not just for Chicago, but from the, the United States right. and around the world. And we do, I think, a terrific service to the rest of the church uh, in, uh, in a facility that is uh, unparalleled in its beauty. In addition to Mundelein Seminary, the Theologate, we have St. Joseph's College Seminary, we have Casa Jesus and the Bishop Abramovich Seminary. Casa Jesus and the Bishop Abramovich Seminary, a little bit different twist on them. Talk to about them for just a bit. Well, and this was an initiative begun to help uh, those students who come from other countries yeah. to master not only English but the American culture, mm -hmm. to know us uh, more deeply. And so we need those, as they call preparatory or propedeutic years, uh, so that they do begin to feel at home here. And what I like about it is uh, both of those programs are run out of uh, a building right next to where I live. That's right. And so I get to see the seminarians uh, with some frequency. They're, uh, they help over at the cathedral for masses on different occasions. And it's easy for me just to uh, walk over and be a part of those communities. Which is important, of course. 
Archbishop, let me ask you, what in your mind are the qualities, the characteristics that a man should have who might be discerning a uh, vocation to the priesthood? What I always tell people to look for in a community is someone who is uh, very involved in the life of the community in a generous way. Uh, that may be uh, someone who is serving Mass uh, with regularity uh, or another person who is involved in the youth program. Uh, a person who is willing to uh, go the extra mile with regard to a parish activity. I think someone who already demonstrates a love for people, the love for the community, and is generous, yeah. I think is the starting point because uh, all other formation that we do, spiritual, apostolic work, intellectual, has to be rooted and grounded in human formation. Mm -hmm. So I want solid human beings. I want people with caring hearts, with generous hearts, uh, who really uh, are not afraid to sacrifice themselves for others. Very nice. What advice would you have for a man who at this moment might be watching, um, who might be discerning a call to the priesthood? I think it's important for them, first of all, just to sit down with the priest and say, what is your life like? Mm -hmm. And to get to know that. Um, but also, I think, for themselves to really pray and maybe even learn how to pray uh, for a discerning heart to see if this is exactly uh, where God is calling them to. They cannot um, in some way make this decision all by themselves. They have to have the support of others, the confirmation of others, that this is something that God is really stirring in their heart. And I think um, that's why it's important for all of us as priests uh, in a particular way, to seek out people, to ask them, oh, yeah. to invite them. Uh, a study was done a number of years ago that showed that about 80% of the priests who ordained had another priest ask them. Oh, all right. However, only one third of our priests are doing the asking. So if we increase the number of priests who are really doing the asking, could that not mean greater numbers in the future? Certainly. Our hope would be that it would. Wonderful. Well, that would be our hope and our prayer, right? And yes. certainly uh, the candidates and men who may be discerning that listen to the Spirit. And that kind of brings us full circle where we began this conversation talking about the Spirit in the ordination rite. Archbishop, as always, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Todd, good to be with you. All Thanks right. a lot. You're welcome. We ask our viewers to stick around. We'll show you the raising of the Cardinal's Galero to the stealing of Holy Name Cathedral. We'll be back in just a moment. To Teach You Christ Is, a campaign for Catholic education and faith formation. I believe that when we are teaching about Jesus Christ to our students, that gives the greatest role model that we could possibly have. You will have the basic tools to make good moral decisions about that will affect your future. Academics are great here. And if you don't understand something, the teachers will work with you to help you understand. Religious education classes help my children to see the difference between right and wrong and make the right decision. To Teach Who Christ Is will be rolled out in parishes across the Archdiocese of Chicago over a three-year period. To find out more about this major fundraising campaign for Catholic education and faith formation, go to toteachwhochristis.org. When I grow up, I want to use my education to help other people and, you know, teach uh, others about God. The Cemetery Ministry is a core ministry of our Catholic faith tied to the corporal works of mercy. It's comforting to know that our Catholic cemeteries are caring for the remains of our loved ones awaiting the resurrection. There are 44 Archdiocese of Chicago Catholic cemeteries willing to help you in your time of loss. Call 708-449-6100 or visit catholiccemeterychicago.org. Catholic Cemeteries, serving the Catholic community since 1837. Welcome back to Catholic Chicago. A Mass was recently celebrated at Holy Name Cathedral honoring the one-month anniversary of the death of Cardinal Francis George. The centuries-old tradition is called the Munzmine Mass, and it included the raising of the Cardinal's Galero to the ceiling of the cathedral. The cathedral's pastor, Monsignor Dan Mayall, explains the significance of this event. The Galero ceremony is really a historical piece. It's uh, got no liturgical significance, 
uh, what the liturgical significance of the whole uh, ceremony is, is the one month uh, date since the Cardinal died. It's an echo. It's the way we echo what we did back in April when we prayed for him and that great turnout showed up here. Uh, this is the echo of it uh, on Sunday. And the Galero part is the punctuation mark at the end where we lift this hat up to a place with the others so that we can pray for him and also remind ourselves of our own mortality. The ceremony at the end of Mass, I'll say the normal closing prayer, the post-communion prayer, and then uh, Father Dan Flens, the Cardinal's assistant, will go over and get the Galero from a table uh, off to the side of the altar. We'll bring it to the place where the wire is hanging and uh, Deacon Stan Strom of the cathedral staff will hook the galero onto the wire and it'll be pulled up and then music will play and the hat will be raised. The other hats are the, uh, are the ones of the five previous cardinals. So the first one would have gone up after Cardinal Mundelein died in 1939, so either in late 39 or early 40, and it's been up there ever since, the one in the center. Uh, the others are, were put up after the death of each of the men who has been named a Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. All of them came to Chicago as, uh, to be installed as the Archbishop. None of them were cardinals when they got here. That happened later on. The significance of it for us right now is that we pray for those great leaders of our church and we remember what they did to increase our faith. Our thanks to Monsignor Dan Mayall. A prayer service and pinwheel planting were part of the Archdiocese of Chicago's observance of Child Abuse Prevention Month in April. Chicago Catholic School children took part in the observance that was held in the Healing Garden at Holy Family Parish in Chicago. April is Child Abuse Prevention Month and every April the Archdiocese of Chicago sponsors this prayer service where we bring children from our Catholic schools to come and pray and sing and then plant their own pinwheels in the garden to raise awareness about child abuse prevention. This year we have St. Angela, St. Tecla, St. Agatha, St. Mary of the Woods, St. Ignatius, and St. Pius V. The pinwheels are meant to be a reminder of childhood, playful and fun, but also it's supposed to be our commitment to preventing child abuse. Society has long had child abuse in it. Now we're talking about winds of change, winds that will prevent it rather than just look over it and, and just allow it to happen. The, the pledge that we all make today, us adults and the children, is that we continue to try our hardest, okay? to live a good life, to pay attention to Jesus, to pay attention to ourselves, and to pay attention to each other, and the care that we care about for each other. This wonderful sculpture of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus uh, clearly shows that they care very deeply for each other. There's a smile on each of their faces, okay? They care deeply for each other. And we We're always 
excited when the children come out. We try to create safe environments in our schools and in our parishes. More importantly, we try to have this April campaign and what it's about be year round. It's not just about April raising awareness, but really trying to prevent child abuse and neglect all year round. The Office for the Protection of Children and Youth has touched more than 600,000 people with its screening, education, and prevention programs. And it has trained more than 200,000 children to recognize and resist potential abusers. Our final story is about Relevant Radio and the wonderful job it's doing to bring God's Word to an extensive audience via the radio waves. Relevant Radio had an impressive turnout at its annual spring luncheon at the Drury Lane Theater and Conference Center in Oak Brook Terrace. This year's luncheon was dedicated to grandparents and others who influence our lives. Well, we're trying to uh, support what Pope Francis has been saying about the family, in particular about love and veneration for our grandparents. So today the theme is bring someone who's been influential in your life, a grandparent, an elderly person, treat them to lunch and honor them. So we're really trying to stay right in tune with what Pope Francis has been saying. Relevant Radio's mission statement is, in part, to help people bridge the gap between faith and everyday life. That phrase means a lot to both listeners and program hosts. My big story is that one day I was driving, listening to the radio, and after being married for 10 years, I'm married 20 years now, for the first time I heard that my vocation in marriage meant that my job was to get my husband to heaven. Immediately, I think my life changed. Then the next day, I started living differently because I thought, well, if I have to get my husband to heaven, how am I going to do that? And now I probably have to get my kids to heaven, too. So I thought, wow, I really need to learn more about my faith. And just with the relevant radio, I learned so much. I love radio because it's intimate. You're speaking to one person at a time, and they may be in their car. And, and uh, some people told me, you're my companion on the commute. And so I love that intimacy. It's what John Paul II referred to as that delicate exchange of heart to heart and mind to mind. And I feel like radio does that. I really feel we can reach people heart to heart and mind to mind through a radio. The luncheon included a blessing from Bishop Vipic, a testimonial from a listener, and a keynote address from Father Francis Hoffman, better known as Father Rocky. It's been an extraordinary year for us in the past 12 months. We've expanded by 40% with new stations in New York City, reaching 16 million people, a new station in Milwaukee, which has a huge footprint. And then social media has really exploded uh, through the platforms of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud. And our reach uh, sometimes is over 10 million people a week through those little messaging. So um, we're, we're tremendously blessed and we couldn't do it without the intercession of St. Joseph and Our Lady and so many of our wonderful associates working there and the encouragement of the bishops and uh, the generosity of our supporters. A reminder to all our viewers that you can listen to Relevant Radio 24-7 in the Chicago area on 9.50 a.m., in the far western suburbs on 9.30 a.m., and 12.70 a.m. in the Gary, Indiana area. And congratulations to the entire Relevant Radio staff. I'm Todd Williamson. Thanks for watching Catholic Chicago. We invite you to watch segments of Catholic Chicago and hundreds of additional Catholic videos at youtube.com forward slash Catholic Chicago. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter.